I can remember as a, as a boy um, just knowing that life was incredible, just knowing that life was really special and knowing that it was this incredible opportunity and the wonder of discovering everything, the wonder of just, um, just being alive you know, how incredible everything was, how exciting everything was. And I can also remember thinking that somehow I wanted my life to make a difference. You know, I can remember thinking, I, I, I'm not sure in what way this is going to pan out or how things are going to look, but I, I, I knew somehow that you know, my life was important. And I knew somehow that um, I, I had something to offer the world. And I, I can remember thinking that really clearly. And then as I grew up and I became a teenager and started to find out more about the world and started to learn about all these ideas that everyone had about what was going on, all these ideas about how I should be behaving, what I should be saying, what kinds of things I should be doing, what kind of activities I should be filling my life with. This sense of, of, of purpose and of meaning and of knowing that my life was incredibly worthwhile just got less and less and less. And as I became a young adult, I basically decided that nothing I did could really make a difference. You know, I felt very disillusioned with the... Um, well, I was involved with the peace movement um, and going on marches and campaigns and demonstrations and something that seemed so worthwhile and so obvious it was so obvious, well, you know, we shouldn't be fighting, we shouldn't be having these wars, it's, there wasn't even a question about it. But becoming very disillusioned with what I saw, first of all, within these organisations, the conflict and anger and, and um, personal, petty personal politics within the organisation, but then on a, on a broader scale with the results of my activities in these organizations. It just seemed like no nothing I did actually really made a difference. And um, I, I became very disillusioned and it seemed like, well, my, my life isn't really that important because no one seems to listen when I do stand up and speak out. And so my focus as I became a, a young adult was, was, was really myself. You know, I figured, well, if I can't really change the world, you know, all these incredible ideals I'd had as a child about how the world should be, and, and knowing deeply and clearly and seeing, I know how the world should be, and I know the way that I see the people around me relating is not the way I want it to be. But slowly I took on board the ideas of the society I was in. And my focus became myself and really, you know, how, how okay, well, I'm going to give up on the world, but how, how can I have a good time? You know, what, what can I do to give myself a pleasant experience? And again, that was really interesting that I, I looked around at the society around me and, and well, what, what are other people doing to seemingly enjoy their lives? And I looked around and growing up in London there was people going to parties and clubs and taking drugs and smoking and drinking lots. And, um, oh, okay, all right, well that's, that's what I'm supposed to be doing then, isn't it? You know, and, and it, it, was, um, it was just so easy to become part of that world. You know, it was just so natural, I was simply doing what everyone around me was doing. But the whole time this was going on, and I looked for my um, happiness in, in other places as well, you know, I looked for it in um, intimate relationships, I looked for it in my work, 
I look for it in um, my physical health, you know, trying to be as healthy as possible, trying to eat really well. I look for it in um, where, where I was going to live, trying to find a beautiful place to live. And, you know, in, in some ways I was quite successful and quite skillful at creating this set of circumstances that I thought was going to make me happy. And I'm sure many of you are as well. But the whole time I was doing this, I knew that there was something else. You know, I just, I, I knew it. And I'd had glimpses of this something else throughout my life. And these glimpses had been so, um, so powerful and so um, undeniable that I knew there was something more than, than what I was being told in the conventional descriptions of what life was and what I should be doing with my life. And so the whole time I was going about this kind of conventional life, I, I, I was looking for something else as well. You know, I was reading books, I was speaking to people, I'd come and check out various talks that different people were giving. You know, I, I was like, I was going about this, this, this life, but I just knew that there was something else. And the whole time I, it was like I had this radar open to try and discover what this something else was and how, how I could you know, really access it rather than having these, these glimpses of it. And these glimpses were so, so powerful and profound, but they were very, very brief and very, very far apart. And when I came across the Balance View training, it was something that I stumbled across. It, it, it was almost, um, again, probably like many of you, it was almost by accident that I, I came across this training and these, these talks and I began to listen to these talks and at, at the beginning there was almost nothing in, in the talk that I understood and, and yet there were things that, that struck me at, at such a deep level um, that I, I listened to more of the talks even if it was still 90% of it I was just like noise, just like sound but there was still something quite soothing about it and, and as I listened more to the talks, I began to recognize actually what I was hearing. And this was actually what I'd always wanted to hear. A very, very accurate and clear description of my own experience of what it meant to be human. And it, by listening to these talks, what was being expressed in them gradually and very gradually for me became more and more obvious just by me listening, just by me hearing these words. They were so, so clear and so direct and always pointing, pointing me back to the fundamental nature of my own experience again and again and again. Just being reminded again and again and again. And what I began to see was that as I listened to more of these talks, I began to allow whatever I was experiencing, all of the descriptions, all of the data, just to be exactly as they were, just for a short moment. And, and this, was, this was totally radical for me, completely new. In all of the years that I'd been alive, I had never done that. Not, not even for one short moment. Maybe that's what these kind of spontaneous um, insights and recognitions had been. There'd been these moments where I just allowed everything to be as it was. But I didn't have any way of, of, of speaking about that. I didn't have any way of educating myself in a way that I could integrate that into my everyday lived experience. So all of the books that I read, all of the people I spoke to about this, all of the talks that I heard about this, um, were very interesting but didn't actually help me in any way because I knew even more that there was something that I wasn't experiencing regularly that was there. Everyone was talking about it, everyone was writing about it, but wh where's my experience of this? All right, I've had this incredible experience on the top of the mountain when the sun was setting and everything was one, but then I came back down off the mountain and had a fight with my girlfriend. And um, 
by showing up to this training, it was amazing to see that without me really doing anything, just by immersing myself in the support of the Four Mainstays, that, that balanced view is the Four Mainstays. The support network that effortlessly allowed this recognition just to grow brighter and brighter in my own direct experience, like the morning sun rising and outshining all of the planets and stars. And it's been such a beautiful journey, because I've become comfortable with myself, I've become comfortable with other people and I really enjoy my life in a way that I never had before. And it's not the kind of enjoyment in the way that other people told me I needed to enjoy my life. There's this strength and this courage to go beyond all conventional assumptions about how I need to be, what I need to say, how my speech should look, what kind of activities I should be involved in. All of those things have less and less grip and less and less power over how I actually live my life. It's amazing to discover this courage within me and to discover that this ideal that I'd had as a boy, that my life was important, that I did have something to contribute to the world, that my life was going to make a difference, was actually true. I'd simply forgotten it, I'd got lost and caught up in this world of data, in this world of descriptions. Now my own experience with, um, with this habitual ways of relating and of particularly dealing with social situations, you know, of, of, of arriving in a large group of people or a party or a, a dinner party, whatever it is, or a huge techno party, it didn't, didn't matter, I was arriving there and not really feeling very comfortable, you know, what is going on here, you know, this is a bit weird, isn't it? And then looking around, so how's everyone else dealing with this? W what are they all doing? Okay, they're, they're, they're having a drink of beer over there, okay, I'm going to have a beer. Oh, I know, I'll smoke a joint, that'll relax me, or... All of these different ways of just making myself feel comfortable. And now what I see is that whatever comes up, I have this simple choice and it's so powerful in social situations to allow myself to feel everything, to feel all of that social anxiety and to allow it to be as it is for a short moment. And there's such power in all of this data when it's allowed to be as it is. So data and open intelligence, the open intelligence that is hearing these words, that is looking through your eyes, are inseparable like the sky and the colour blue. And because they're inseparable, it's only when you allow the data to be as it is that open intelligence can become obvious and noticed. So each short moment of allowing the data to be as it is, is to extract this power of great benefit. Is to allow yourself to be however you want to be. To no longer be a victim to all of these conventional descriptions. And so I saw for myself that very quickly some of these learned habits and ways of relating and <coughs> behaviours dropped away very quickly and it was amazing to take short moments with all of the cravings and thoughts and desires and actions and guilt afterwards to recognise that all of these were shining forth from open intelligence. Because until I recognised that, I would be behaving as if they still had this power. But there were some that didn't drop away quite so easily. And this is where the relationship with the trainer is so powerful. This is where to open yourself up and to talk about these things, to find solutions and see how you can extract the power from these other habitual patterns that seem to hang around even after you've been introduced. This is the purpose of the trainer. Now all of us have these patterns, all of us have these things that we've just been repeating so long that they seem to be part of who we are. And I saw very clearly with many of them that they were just stories I'd been telling myself. But others, the stories I'd been telling myself for so long, it needed some support. 
It needed some guidance, it needed a clear overview for me to see that I could take responsibility for these two. And so this relationship with the trainer is so, su such a support. You know, to really get real with yourself about everything that's going on for you. Because when you can share these deepest, darkest secrets, you know, the things that you're really embarrassed about doing, the things that you don't even tell your intimate partner, the things that you definitely don't tell your mother. <laughs> now these things, we're, we're convinced that they have this power over <coughs> us, or that somehow they're not included within this vast expanse of open intelligence. So to share these with a trainer is to empower them with this, this great benefit that is at their source, to no longer be a victim to them. And to have the opportunity of, to have somebody who you can actually ask about these things. I mean, it's incredible. <coughs> I still can't believe how, how fortunate I am to have that, that kind of support. You know, somebody who is there for me totally. Who will support me through whatever I'm going through. And will only empower me to step into my own power of great benefit and the rest of the support network just provides this, it's like, um, it's like this huge safety net. You know, it can feel like you're walking this trapeze, oh, what's going to happen now, I'm, you know, I'm not going to rely on my data, I'm going to rely on open intelligence, that feels a little, a little shaky, like being on a, a high wire. But there's this safety net of the four mainstays. So it's almost like if you fall off, you just bounce and you're back on the wire, oh wow, <laughs> I'm all right. Yeah, I mean, and that's been my experience. I'm just so, so grateful for the support that I receive and the way that we all inspire each other here.